the title of this presentation, uh, as uh, Marisol has introduced, somewhat of a mouthful, but we're going to go ahead and unpack it all. Pitfalls and possibilities for ethical partnerships and critical, critical pedagogy in service learning and community engagement in the COVID-19 era. And I welcome you all to um, introduce yourself via the chat if you want, although I suppose that has already happened in part through the land acknowledgement, which is great. Um, also note my email address there, and I'd love to hear from any of you at any time. Um, so, why, okay, there we go. So today's plan, um, I'm going to sort of unpack that very wordy title uh, and spend a little bit of time just sort of introducing what I see as the key questions that we're here to wrestle with. Uh, then we're going to take a poll, and I'm, I'm really curious to see where all of you stand with regard to these key questions. And then I'm going to share sort of the case study of Om Prakash, which is the nonprofit I've been leading uh, for the last 15 years, um, and sort of a series of different case studies of how we approach this complexity. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A, and then we'll, for the last 30 minutes, uh, we'll move into breakout rooms to where you all can discuss this further in much smaller groups. Um, having said that, if you do have big questions that come up at any time during the presentation, feel free to put them into the chat, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those. So the first part of the title of this talk is about ethical partnerships. And what in the world do we mean when we talk about ethical partnerships in service learning and community engagement? Uh, obviously, that's a huge question. Many books have been written on this, and many, many people these days in and beyond the higher ed sector are kind of mobilizing the language of ethical volunteering, ethical service learning, ethical engagement, responsible, et cetera. Um, I will be the first to say, I think a lot of times those terms are used in a pretty vacuous way. And I think it's important to really think about what we mean. So I don't attempt to offer a ultimate definition, but I want to raise a few big questions that I see as being essential here. First of all, who has power and autonomy to define programming? And I am going to go ahead and say that the dominant model that most of us are familiar with around placements where a student is placed in some kind of service or community engagement position. Um, Om Prakash has existed for the last 15 years in many ways uh, with the intention of disrupting that placement paradigm and offering an alternative to it. And the reason I say that is that in the dominant placement model, the, the entity with the most power to define a given program is not the host community. Uh, the, think about the very language of placements. Uh, there's some sort of middleman entity, maybe it's the university, maybe it's a third party that is placing students in positions, and the host organization in that image is kind of a passive recipient. Um, so that is often a concern for me, especially if that placement is being incentivized by some kind of financial transaction, which very often it is. Um, so that's one thing we think about. Um, Whose interests are driving the program design? Um, here's where I like to think about the difference between what we could call mission-centered program programming versus student-centered or volunteer-centered. Um, now, there's an interesting point here because in many cases, I think uh, educators in this space recognize the hubris and arrogance and sort of um, just naivete in thinking that, you know, student service learning or volunteering is going to, um, quote unquote, like make a big impact. And so there's this movement towards humility, which I really appreciate, where people say, look, you know, it's not about students aren't going to go save the day. This is really about um, students own learning and the student experience. And just think about it. Um, they're going to have this experience now and it's going to inform them for the rest of their lives. And while I agree with the premise there of we should not have overly inflated ideas of our own impact, um, especially if we're talking about like a short term, you know, college, you know, let's say alternative spring break type of program or something, of course, we shouldn't over exaggerate the impact. But if we shift so much then to saying, yeah, what this is really all about is just making sure the students have a good experience or that the volunteers have an enriching experience. Um, I worry a lot that we run into this kind of mission drift where the hosting organization is no longer sort of playing the role of a social impact organization achieving a certain mission and instead they've become basically uh, 
you know, a host in the service industry providing a certain experience to students. Um, so to me, that does not align with what I would consider ethical partnerships. And again, this becomes more complicated when financial incentives are involved. Um, and so finally, that's the third question. How are we navigating financial incentives? On the one hand, making sure that um, community partners, uh, you know, that there's some fairness and, and financial reciprocity. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, but on the other hand, if the entire premise of the partnership is reduced to basically a business venture where, uh, let's say, a university and a community-based organization are working together to sell an experience to students, even if that is reciprocal and fair, I'm still not sure that is um, in the broader spirit of what we are striving for when we're talking about ethical community engagement and service learning. So that, those are some questions to get you thinking on this first part of the session regarding ethical partnerships. How about critical pedagogy? What are we talking about here? Um, broadly speaking, what I'm talking about here is the types of learning that students are doing in conjunction with our programs. And um, it is, in my view, not sufficient to assume that it's experiential learning and that therefore students just learn through the experience. Of course, we need um, scaffolding and various kinds of intentionality that go into the ways we structure learning opportunities for students. Uh, but so what do we mean when we talk about critical pedagogy in that case? Uh, to me, that is being attentive to power and positionality within the world and within the classroom. So within the world, meaning if, if we're running you know, service learning or community engagement programs and we're not asking students to think about power and inequality um, and the structural arrangements that create the problems we're trying to solve, then we're really missing something. Um, but in addition to talking about that within the world, we need to be thinking about that within the classroom as well. And if we are employing classroom models and pedagogical approaches that disempower students um, and treat students as simply uh, consumers of a kind of educational product or um, somewhat you know, passive uh, participants being placed in some kind of experience, uh, to me there's a pedagogical problem there. Um, secondly, um, disrupting the hierarchical banking model of education. Uh, so here I'm referring to the work of Paulo Freire and his notion of uh, his critique of the dominant banking model wherein uh, students are imagined as sort of passive receptacles teachers are imagined to have the knowledge and to be depositing it, depositing it into students minds um, there's a hierarchy there's a power relationship there and one would argue that no matter how much knowledge you transfer to students if they are constantly in that passive recipient role um, they are never really being empowered and that exact dynamic I think also transfers from the education space into broader concepts of community development. Um, critical pedagogy means getting beyond that banking model where we have experts giving things to passive beneficiaries and uh, it's envisioning a more um, collaborative shared journey uh, where teachers are also students and students are also teachers and uh, beneficiaries are also helpers and so on. Um, Again, drawing from Paulo Freire, I think for me, uh, critical pedagogy means we are teaching students to read the world. We are teaching them to look critically upon the world right in front of them. And that um, invites the possibility of community-based research and dialogue and um, not settling for the simple um, be nice to people, try to do good things in the world type of analysis, but deeply reading the circumstances around you and trying to understand um, why things look the way they do. And then moving forward from there into uh, raising consciousness and trying to raise that understanding in yourself and in others. Um, and then finally, I love this line from Bell Hooks that knowledge is a field in which we all labor. Um, so critical pedagogy for me is that uh, knowledge is not something that is static and kind of passed along and you know you go through and you check the boxes and, and the, the great expert can decide if you're qualified or not. Uh, but knowledge is something that we are always constantly creating together and it is powerful and it, it has um, transformative potential. Um, so I've said a bit about what I think about ethical partnerships and critical pedagogy and the question now of course is how does that, how do those show up in our own programming uh, especially in light of COVID-19. And so here's this poll, and please take your time. There's seven questions. 
uh, take your time to answer the poll. Uh, and I'm assuming that one of our campus contact colleagues will uh, let us know when the uh, poll is done. Or, I'm not sure quite how that works, but whenever we're, we've reached uh, critical mass, we can share those poll results. Yep, I'm going to end it in about 20 seconds. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, cool. So I'm now really excited um, to talk through this together. And obviously, I don't know what to expect, so it's going to be interesting. So which describes you, this is just kind of get, telling us who's here. So mostly, we've got higher ed administrators and faculty. Um, how has COVID affected programming? Um, it seems that uh, some programming has stopped. Um, a lot has shifted online, which would have been my expectation, and some is still continuing. Um, with distancing. Um, so, hearkening back to our question around, you know, ethical engagement, ethical partnerships, um, I wanted to ask this question to get you all thinking about how those partnerships work in your case. So, partners have independent power and autonomy to define how they work with students, 34%. Um, universities mediate the process, but I still feel good about partners' power and autonomy. That's 69%, so that's great. Of course, we can recognize we all probably have some confirmation bias here, um, but that's great to see. And um, then lesser in the other two categories. Um, how has COVID affected partners' power and autonomy? This is really interesting to me. So some folks think that pandemic has amplified partners' power. Others think it has reduced partners' power, the, the majority. Um, and I'm really curious to hear more about how that is happening. I think that's a really important phenomenon for all of us to pay attention to. Um, if we are committed to um, empowering community partners uh, through our work and the pandemic is working against that, um, yeah, I think it's really important to understand why that's happening and, and what we can do to disrupt that. And I think the world, this will all come to light further um, as we go further in the presentation and in our breakout room. Um, how has COVID affected learning opportunities for students? So most people are 
creating synchronous online learning opportunities uh, such as video calls and then many almost yeah, similarly many are also offering asynchronous um, and some are also offering in-person opportunities and it seems like there's quite a blend of different things that students are doing here which is cool um, real-time discussion with peers uh, is you know topping it out but lots of asynchronous engagement as well and a lesser amount uh, of students creating stuff, and this is something I want to focus on in a moment, but um, it seems like you know, lots of students are talking and, and engaging in sort of internalizing content. Um, less, a fewer number of students are doing research, sharing stories, creating content, uh, but still a, a significant share, so that's great. And then finally, I'm curious about this question. Um, how satisfied are we? Um, it's good enough, but not great. That's a pretty good place to be. Um, I want to think about today, how can we all get here? What would it look like to use digital learning, not just as kind of like a stopgap measure during this pandemic, but um, to, to envision digital learning and digital praxis and critical pedagogy through digital technology in ways that we can feel empowered and excited about it. Um, I'm glad that no one feels that, or very few people feel that it's painful and dehumanizing. Um, I will also say I'm a little surprised to see that. Um, it's great news, but I've talked to quite a few students who went through their spring quarter or semester, and I would say they would be in the um, unsatisfied or very unsatisfied category. And that idea of you know it being kind of dehumanizing and kind of death by Zoom is definitely I think a real threat that's out there that we need to be thinking about. Um, so anyway, thanks for this. This gives all of us a sense of who else is in the room and kind of what are the larger trends that we are uh, looking at. And so, you know, what, what are the larger social trends that we're immersed in um, in light of this pandemic? And uh, with that in mind, I now just want to kind of talk through um, some of the, that big question for us all. So how is how do we expect that COVID-19 is impacting ethical partnerships and critical pedagogy? Um, you know, especially, I want to say, uh, by way of introduction to this point, um, probably none of us would have thought that we as a, as a field, as a sector, you know, that high, the higher ed sector already had ethical partnerships and critical pedagogy figured out before the pandemic. I mean, if anyone thinks that way, that's great. Congratulations, but also um, I'm curious where you're, uh, you know, what game you're watching. Because I think, you know, for me, for years, I've been thinking about and, and critical, criticizing and trying to disrupt and improve the dominant models of partnerships and, and pedagogy in this space. And um, I, I think I know there's a lot of amazing work happening, but also I think there's a long way to go. And that was even before the pandemic. So, um, I, I think that implications of the pandemic are quite serious. And it's noteworthy that in the poll, the majority of people said that they thought the pandemic was uh, you know, further disempowering partners in these relationships. Um, so the first thing I want to just mention here is this phenomenon of online placements. And I, I alluded to this earlier, um, but I think the placement model in general, whether we're talking about local community engagement or students doing some kind of global service learning around the world, the, the idea that um, if students are applying for an internship, they're going to apply to an organization and the organization um, is presumably going to like re read their resume and interview them and make a decision. But if a student is going to do some kind of service, um, then they can just get placed there by a middleman. I have always found that to be a strange assumption. Um, and I do think it, it um, kind of, reflects some deeper uh, ways in which service and community engagement are kind of uh, marginalized and de-intellectualized and considered like, oh, that's so nice, kind of pat on the head. Yeah, let's go place you somewhere. And I have always felt concerned about the ways in which students and host organizations are disempowered there. And even more so, I've felt concerned about the commodification that happens there and the way that many, many, many uh, sort of middlemen organizations sell placement. You know, if you Google right now volunteer abroad, you know, intern abroad in X country, 
95% of what you find, I promise you, will be some sort of middleman company selling a packaged experience, usually for quite a high price. So when we ask how is community engagement and service learning shifting with COVID-19, well, certainly, as we saw in the poll, lots of things are moving online. And there's this kind of online volunteering, online service, online internships. Um, but what I've observed is that in many cases, those are still following this placement paradigm. And I have seen, uh, I'm sure many of you have also seen, all of a sudden those same types of middleman organizations that were selling the package chaperone global service trip or domestic service trip are now selling a packaged online internship or online service experience. And I am just as concerned about that. Uh, it seems almost even more um, problematic in some ways. Um, in other ways, maybe not. But uh, so I want to flag that. That's one thing I've certainly noticed. And I think we need to wonder about this kind of old wine and new bottles, um, the commodification of relationship, this whole kind of placement industry. Um, I also think it's, it's important to note how financial stressors that are being introduced by the pandemic um, arguably expose the risks of volunteer-centered models and transactional concepts of reciprocity. By that, what I mean is this. Imagine a case, and probably many of you have seen cases like this, where you have a host organization, a partner organization, that typically has gotten part of their, they've funded part of their budget through kind of fees from volunteers or donations from volunteers in some way or another. And now all of a sudden, with the pandemic, um, that is all shut down and they can't, um, that money has dried up because students travel to work with them and so on. Uh, and those organizations now are having a hard time funding their budgets because they've lost this huge revenue source. Um, some would say, oh, that's so bad, that's so unfortunate, now our partners are vulnerable. The best thing we can do to help them is to figure out some way that they can resume you know, making money by selling a volunteer experience. Um, to me, that feels quite short-sighted, and that kind of misses the point. And to me, the point is that um, any model which, in which a social impact organization is able to survive only by selling a volunteer experience, I worry that that kind of volunteer-centered model can lead to a sort of dependency and uh, a hierarchy and a power relationships built into that, as well as um, just sort of uh, a fragility where if um, you have a case where people can't come volunteer, all of a sudden the organization is, is out of money. So I would say rather than use this moment as an opportunity to say, oh, how can we bring that same model back but do it online, um, in these cases I think it's a really good opportunity to question the sustainability of that model in the first place. Um, the same is to be said for this, these transactional concepts of reciprocity. The idea of reciprocity is very popular when people talk about ethical partnerships. Um, and I think that's great conceptually, uh, but if reciprocity simply means, hey, we're going to sell some experience, but then we'll share them, we'll share the revenue. Um, I think that's quite a shallow way of thinking about reciprocity. And um, that limits what is supposedly about relationships and solidarity and collaboration and community engagement. It reduces the whole thing to basically a, a business metric and saying, oh yeah, we you know, we can call it a social innovation or whatever, uh, but basically we're now talking about we'll work with students uh, or we'll work with community partners, whether that's locally or internationally, to kind of create some product that students will buy. And I'm not saying that that's intrinsically bad, but I think that if that's as far as we get in thinking about reciprocity is how are we going to share the proceeds, um, I think we're failing to ask the bigger questions about organizational resilience and sustainability and empowerment. Finally, um, when I think about online learning, uh, what I see is a lot of new technology. Obviously, there's been a huge shift towards online learning technology in the last few months, but in many cases, uh, somewhat regressive pedagogy. Uh, by that, I mean um, the, the entire premise of, oh, well, this is great. Now I can film my lecture and present it to 1,000 people or 100,000 people instead of just 100 people. Um, you know, that predate, that idea predates COVID. That goes back to the, the, the rise of the MOOCs about a decade ago. And people were so excited about that. But from a pedagogical standpoint, the idea of essentially, um, you know, broadcasting a lecture 
is pedagogically uh, archaic in a way. It is, it is the quintessential banking model where you have an expert um, who's kind of sharing their expertise and everyone else is completely passive behind a screen, dehumanized, uh, receiving that information. So I'm not just here to kind of condemn lectures, but the point is that I think simply moving into the online learning space um, does not in any way mean that therefore we are going to be advancing pedagogically and, and, and moving towards a more critical pedagogy. Uh, if anything, I think there are risks of the opposite. And so our responsibility and kind of the, the challenge and what we're exploring here today is how can we use digital technology to deepen ethical partnerships, to deepen critical pedagogy? How can we use um, the circumstances of this pandemic, which have forced us all to do more things online, how can we use that as an opportunity to build new systems and new models that are going to be more mutually empowering beyond the pandemic, rather than simply a stopgap measure to get through the pandemic? So with that said, I now want to shift into a case study of sorts. Um, we're sharing the work of Om Prakash, which again is a nonprofit that I've been leading since 2004. And I want to just introduce this by saying, um, yes, Om Prakash partners with universities. Yes, I'm very excited to talk to anyone who's on this call and would be interested in working together. But um, in offering this case study of our own work, I really want to do so humbly and share what we're doing and share some of the challenges of it and, um, and use this as a learning opportunity. My goal here is not to say Om Prakash has got all this figured out. Not at all. But rather, I want to emphasize that Om Prakash has been thinking about these questions of digital technology, critical pedagogy, and ethical partnerships for a long time. And I'm excited to share with you what that looks like. So I'm going to briefly stop my screen share, make sure everyone's still awake. Looks like it. Um, and uh, I'm going to take a peek in the chat here um, just to make sure that I haven't missed any big questions. Doesn't, uh, some things are interesting here. Partners have autonomy in canceling student internships. That's interesting. Um, and yeah, I'll, again, feel free to drop questions in the chat, but I'm just going to assume that um, everyone's still with me. So I'm now going to share my screen again and tell you more about Om Prakash. Um, so, uh, Om Prakash is a web-based organization that facilitates relationships, dialogue, and learning between social change agents around the world. So what does that actually mean? Um, there are a lot of different parts of what we do. First of all, we have our network, and that network includes uh, grassroots partner organizations in 48 countries around the world. And these partners use our platform to connect with students, volunteers, interns, and to showcase their work. Um, we also offer a customizable online learning platform called Edge, which is custom built for this kind of programming. Edge is an online learning platform that builds reflection and dialogue as it relates to community engagement and service learning programming. Uh, we have Global Dialogue, which is an open forum for folks to discuss some of the key issues. We have a crowdfunding platform that our partners use, partners around the world can use this, and we offer them a tax deduction, uh, or, you know, we offer them a fiscal sponsorship, meaning they can, um, the platform is tax deductible for their donors. Um, so just as an aside, if, as I go through this presentation, if you know of organizations in your community that could benefit from becoming Om Prakash partners and using our platform to connect with volunteers and to crowdfund, uh, by all means, point them our way. Um, and then we, you know, we also understand our work as sort of curating storytelling, and we host a blog, and we, we want to be able to amplify voices and stories from many different actors around the world. Um, in terms of ethical partnerships and what that looks like for us, so as I've mentioned, we have this network of partners. Um, organizations, any organization in the world can apply to become a partner. We vet them very carefully. We only accept about 10 to 15 percent of organizations that apply. But once an organization becomes a partner, they show up on our search page. So you or your students anytime could come here and could search for opportunities um, based on uh, the type of work. Right now, of course, mostly it's online positions. Um, but pre-COVID, you know, many folks used Om Prakash to find um, travel opportunities around the world to go and work with our partners. 
uh, but our partners span many different areas, and um, I welcome you and your students to come here and use this to find organizations and connect with them. I want to emphasize this is not about placement. There's no way to buy a trip to Kenya or whatever it may be, uh, but rather you can, students can connect with partners and apply directly to them. And so to give you an example, um, we'll look at the profile of this organization in Chile and um, where it says average daily cost, that's just the cost of living in this country. That does not, you don't, you're not paying um, like a volunteer fee or something to work with them. But I can look at this profile and the key info is um, the organization has written this informa information themselves. Um, Home Prakash is not like packaging this up and reselling it or anything like that. Um, this organization in Chile has managed their profile and they've created all these different positions. And you'll see a lot of them are online positions. So they're looking for um, students or volunteers to help um, children with homework and um, translation work and multimedia design work, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and this is just one partner out of 178. So you can start to imagine the depth of opportunities available in our network. Uh, the idea is that anyone can come here and apply directly. And if they do so, the partner organization is the one that receives that application, vets them, interviews them, and ultimately makes a decision. So I don't mean to suggest that somehow, because we have this website that does these things, therefore it's ethical partnerships. But what I am trying to do is to get you all thinking about how some of these basic structural things, like who gets to define the positions? Who gets to describe the work of the organization? who gets to vet the volunteers, um, who reads the volunteers' application, um, who's playing gatekeeper, essentially, who has the power. To me, you can't talk about ethical partnerships without talking about those questions. And so to me, it's quite ironic when folks might have very elaborate theories of what an ethical partnership is or what that looks like, but then at the end of the day, um, they're kind of selling students like a package chaperone experience where the host partner is in that role of passive beneficiary. To me, that's a deep contradiction, and I see it happening all the time. And on precaution, over the last 15 years, we've tried to come up with a platform that kind of gets around that, uh, which is not to say that I think it's a perfect solution by any means. Um, just to give you a glimpse, uh, one from a volunteer standpoint, after a student has applied for a position and they're confirmed with a partner, um, this is just kind of a demo, but you can see they have a direct like chat possibility with the partner through the dashboard. And we also have this goal manager, which is basically like a, a task manager, project manager, where the partner organization can be creating specific goals for the volunteer to complete and then chatting with the volunteer about it here. Again, this is obviously just test data that you're seeing. But uh, so again, we are trying to give your students and your partners or our partners um, not just some abstract idea of ethical partnership, but actual digital tools to allow them to engage in a more direct and holistic way with students and service learners. Um, so that's all good, and we're proud of that. We've been doing that for a while, but none of this gets towards the critical pedagogy piece. And the history of Own Prakash is basically for the first seven or eight years, we focused on the partner network. We focused on um, connecting students with partners around the world. Um, but we realized eventually around 2012 that we needed to do so much more to really um, provide educational services for students and um, to help students grapple with the ethical complexities of crossing differences of culture and power with the intentions of doing good. Uh, there's so much that can go wrong in this space. There's so much risk of neocolonialism and paternalism and uh, re-perpetuating the same hierarchies and inequalities that we seek to address. Um, and from our view, radical, critical education has to be the way we address that. And that doesn't mean sending your students a PDF to read before they leave home. And it doesn't mean, um, you know, hosting a Zoom call from time to time. It has to mean a deeper, more rigorous learning process. And so with that as our motivation, um, in 2012, we launched our EDGE program. And so EDGE is what you're seeing here. This is an example of an EDGE cohort. EDGE is our customized online learning platform through which we try to enact the sort of critical pedagogy that I was talking about before. So this is not just about content delivery. This is not just another way for students to you know, watch lectures and, and read articles. Um, it is a platform that supports engaging with curriculum, but it also supports each and every student to 
to do their own digital storytelling, their own consciousness raising. And it supports students to be in dialogue with each other and with their mentors. Um, so I want to now give you a bit of a tour of the EDGE platform. Uh, and again, my goal is twofold. First of all, if any of you are thinking that you might want to be um, deepening and amplifying your own online learning work and you like what you see here, we are always very happy to partner uh, to build custom programs. Uh, but secondly, even if you have no interest in working with us, my hope would be that what I show you here raises some ideas and possibilities that can get you more excited about digital learning so that um, you're in that first category of feeling empowered and excited by digital learning. By the way, that doesn't need to mean you don't also want to be face to face with your students. Of course you do. We all want that. Um, but in my mind, these two are not oppositional. And um, particularly in cases where students are working in disparate ways across communities, um, I think there's a strong need for digital learning in the community engagement service learning space, even if there's not a pandemic going on. Uh, because there's only so much amount of time we can be in the same classroom as our students, especially if they are in disparate locations fulfilling their um, service learning or community engagement programs. So uh, with that in mind, we created the EDGE platform seven or eight, seven or eight years ago uh, and have been constantly improving it since then. And obviously, we're now living through a circumstance where we have to be online. But in our mind, again, this is not just like a stopgap measure. This is meant to integrate with um, experiential learning and that's what we've been doing um, over the years. So I want to give a brief overview here. This is a custom program we run with Florida State University called the FSU Global Scholars Program. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that program later, but I just want you to see within an EDGE cohort, um, students can chat with each other one-on-one uh, -on -one, or there's a group chat, there's video chat options. Um, you can see the recent activity of all the students in the cohort. Um, there's the classroom component, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, we have this announcement section where we can tell students about upcoming webinars and so on. Um, and then there's the storytelling component where every student can be doing their own storytelling, creating a digital portfolio, and where all of those stories can be aggregating to one page for the whole program. And I want you to just think about how different that is than the paradigm of, you know, write out a Word document and, and email it into your professor or submit it via Canvas or Blackboard and it never sees the light of day again. Um, that to us, from my view, the kind of um, submit your work to your professor paradigm is not critical pedagogy. That is reinforcing the banking model and the hierarchy of, okay, you know, hopefully the expert approves of what I've done. And what we've tried to create here is a much more dialogical, community-driven model where students are sharing their work with each other and with a broader audience as well, inspired by that, that model of raising consciousness. Um, so uh, within the EDGE classroom, um, this is, for example, like a custom course that we've built for Florida State, as I was saying. Um, within the classroom, there's a certain number of units. And within each unit, there's a certain number of slides. Um, and I'm just going to give you a glimpse of a few different classrooms. Um, broadly speaking, most of our programs that we've been running since long before the pandemic uh, have kind of done three things. First, for the first few units, um, we are encouraging students to reflect on their own positionality and these questions around power and privilege and identity that I see as being central to critical pedagogy. Um, asking students to reflect on their own intentions. What are you trying to achieve out of this? Why do you want to do this community engagement program and so on? The next few units um, are sort of around reading the world, as, as Paulo Freire puts it, and trying to understand why our world looks the way it does, trying to understand the root causes of particular social issues um, and current inequalities. Um, and then from there, we shift into training students in community-based research methods and digital storytelling techniques so that students can be doing that work themselves and working to raise consciousness. So again, did, what we're looking at here is digital learning that is not just about consuming content, it is about creating knowledge, mobilizing knowledge together, um, having every student see themselves not as sort of trying to pass the test or trying to go and help people, both of which are problematic in their own ways, but as trying to understand the root causes of particular social issues and then raise consciousness about what they've found. Um, so uh, we have adapted that in a number of ways in light of current circumstances. Um, this is just showing an example of how within our classroom um, students engage with, with some broader thinking about praxis. Um, 
But we have developed a lot of new content in relation to what's going on right now um, in our world. So for example, many of you might be familiar with this essay by Ivan Illich, um, To Hell With Good Intentions. Uh, the cool thing about discussing this within the EDGE context is students don't just read it, uh, they read it, but then they're also able to have an asynchronous kind of comment stream conversation here uh, where different students can share their own reflections and um, I could now come in here and write my own reflection and mention one of these students and they'll get an email notification. So we're sort of supporting that ongoing, um, ongoing dialogue. Uh, we have developed a lot of new content that is engaging with, uh, well, this is, we've always talked about inequality and I'm just gonna quickly show you like some of the ways we do that, um, looking at lots of different data visualizations and so on, um, getting, folks to think about many different axes of inequality. Um, and again, this is just one slide within one unit of a much larger course. So I don't want you to think this is like the whole program, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of, of what we do here. Um, but needless to say, in our present circumstances, there's lots of ways to think about inequality that don't just have to do with um, this kind of first world, third world binary, which of course is a false binary to begin with. Um, but so for example, we've developed um, in the recent weeks, a lot of new content that is um, getting us to think about the current struggle for racial justice um, in dialogue with larger questions that we've always been asking around positionality and power and privilege and inequality and so on. Um, we uh, indeed have sort of doubled down on some of the ways that we talk about race uh, and encourage students to be thinking about race uh, in the context of their own engagement. Um, and so I should make it clear, the students who are going through these EDGE programs are very often doing an internship with an Om Prakash partner at the same time, or they are preparing for that. So we might have a student in, um, I'll just say in Seattle, which is where I live, who is doing an online internship with an Om Prakash partner in uh, Kenya, but at the same time, we are encouraging them to be thinking about um, issues of such as racial inequality, for example, how those are being exacerbated by COVID-19 and how those are manifesting in their own context and around the world. So this is not just sort of a narrow conception of, oh, prepare, you know, training for volunteering abroad or training for community engagement um, in a kind of vocational sense, but it's also much broader and theoretical and pushing students to be thinking about these much bigger structural questions. Um, out, so that was all the edge classroom, but then outside of the classroom, um, students can see who else is involved in the, in the cohort via the directory. Um, and then every single student has their own profile. And that profile page is going to aggregate their, um, all of the blog posts that they write. And that's separate than the classroom. The classroom work is private only to members of the classroom, but we want all of our edge students to also build a public facing digital portfolio like this, which is part of their broader work of critical pedagogy and raising consciousness and um, investigating the world through a critical lens and then sharing that with a broader audience. And the really cool thing is that all of the students in a given cohort, um, all of their posts will aggregate to the same page um, so a given university or a given program can have a single page like this that is aggregating the different posts and reflections from all of their students. And so just to give you a quick um, browse through what's happening, we have this student happens to be in Maine talking about COVID through my eyes. Um, here's a student in California talking about COVID in the context of, of whiteness. Um, here we have one of our partner organizations in Kenya, actually, who's talking about indigenous responses to COVID-19 among the Maasai. Here's a student um, talking about machismo and Latinx worlds. Um, it goes on and on, and this is all just kind of coming in in real time. So here's a student talking about um, COVID in relation to Native Americans um, and uh, marginalization and praxis in Seattle. Uh, so the point being that uh, this is not just about like take an online course and submit the answers to your professor, but it's about giving students a platform and a space in which to share their work with each other and to be engaging with critical issues, even if those aren't directly related to their own community engagement work. Um, just to show another example of that, uh, when we partner with a given university such as Florida State, as I was describing before, um, they get their own page like this that aggregates 
you know, we can have information about the program, and then that page will aggregate all of their, um, all of the posts from their students, and I can even see all of those students here. Um, so if at your university you're thinking, yeah, I wish we had more ways to help our students document their community engagement work and share their reflection, and for us to showcase that on our own website, the cool thing is we can embed this entire page on your website. So rather than manually copy and pasting student testimonials or stories, you can have this kind of real-time feed of what all of your students are doing. Um, there's so much more I would want to show you, but I'm, I'm conscious of time and I want some time for questions, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, but that was a broad overview of our platform. Again, not to say it's perfect, but just to say that this is what it looks like in my world when I'm talking about um, using digital technology to advance ethical partnerships and critical pedagogy. Um, I do want to point out, uh, for those of you who are interested in the sort of academic side of this, um, on our website, on the press page, you can see some of our recent peer-reviewed papers thinking about um, student frustration as an outcome of critical service learning, thinking about digital mentorship um, and undergraduate research, um, thinking about this placement paradigm that you've heard me critique a little bit now, um, thinking about reciprocity. So we do have a number of um, peer-reviewed papers here for you to check out, as well as other um, non-peer-reviewed work. Um, and I'm going to stop the screen share with that. Um, and why don't we go into a bit of a Q&A? So I'm very happy to hear any uh, questions whatsoever about anything that I said, although rather than hear it, I guess, um, the chat not be in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the chat might make the most sense. Um, so there's a question okay. of can you share so, how Alpaganash yep. is currently managing, nurturing, cultivating partnerships with community based mm -hmm. organizations around the world? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for that question, Jennifer. Um, and I, I'm going to just share my screen back just because I have a little slide here um, for the QA. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that work of supporting our partners is something we are always doing. And um, the, uh, what that looks like is, in the context of COVID, uh, we've been supporting our partners to transfer their positions to online positions. And over the last few months, uh, we now have, like, over 80 partners have created online positions on our platform. Uh, we've also, you know, we do have our own internal resources that we fundraise for and so on, um, or that we generate through earned revenue programs. And as much as possible, we try to kind of share those with our partners. So we launched an emergency grant program for our partners um, called the Web Access Support Program, just to help partners pay for their cost of the internet. Um, so we've developed that new internal grant program. Um, as I've mentioned, many of our partners um, choose to use our platform for, um, for crowdfunding, and we also have adapted our Edge online learning platform to offer um, to offer online trainings for our partners. So um, we have offered a number of courses to our partners, and um, in light of the pandemic, uh, we are offering a new, completely free online learning series for students and for partners. Um, the series is called Facing Pandemic. You can find a link to it right on our homepage. But so, yeah, we've been offering these online trainings and resources to our partners. Um, we have an, another internal grant program called the Partner Development Grant, where we are offering consultancy to partners, so, you know, paid for by Om Prakash. Um, so the bigger picture is simply that, um, you know, our logo is an empty bowl. And that is because we view our role not as like pushing a certain agenda so much as holding the open space um, to support lots of different stakeholders pursuing their own agendas. And we are always working on that empty bowl and making it bigger and bigger to hold more and more. But um, yeah, what, different partners are able to show up and say, hey, here's how I want to use this platform. And we're really happy to do so. But the key point is that our partners do not simply exist for the sake of hosting volunteers. I, unfortunately, I think a lot of these community engagement partnerships, like that's the whole thing. And Getting back to this question of ethical partnerships, I think that's somewhat of a narrow conception. And for us, um, yeah, partners can choose to host students, volunteers, or interns if and when they want to, but becoming an Omprakash partner does not in any way oblige you to do that. There's all these other things we offer to them. Um, 
So there's more I could say, but I'll pause on that. Uh, I also see a recent question. If a student looks for an internship or experience on your platform, is there a charge for the student? And the answer is emphatically no. And that is central to our mission as a nonprofit. Uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, uh, I created this platform because I was frustrated by feeling that relationships were being commodified and that um, as a young person wanting to connect with a locally led social impact organization somewhere else in the world, the only way I could do so was by paying a fee to a middleman. And I didn't like that. And I still don't like that. And that is why Om Prakash offers our network of partners completely free of cost. Um, our revenue model is we're a nonprofit. We do some fundraising, but most of our budget is funded by earned revenue through our EDGE program. And so what that looks like is partnering with universities and helping them develop customized online learning programs to amplify their students' learning. In many cases, that happens in a hybrid way, hand in hand with faculty members. And in other cases, um, it's purely online. Um, but either way, the point is that we do not charge students for browsing our network. It's open to the public. Um, so um, can you list the available ways in which we can serve? Uh, I'm not totally sure I understand the scope of that question, but basically students can go to our search page and browse partners, and we have 180 some partners in 45 countries, and that might look like education, health, gender-based advocacy, disability-related work, immigration-related work, uh, microfinance, very wide range of possibilities. And, um, and yeah, you're free to browse and apply to partners. Um, you got the maybe next question? Maybe one more question. Yeah, how do you yeah, identify um, and expose and validate the unrecognized forms of power relations along with community partners, partnerships to further establish autonomy among stakeholders and to further focus on the mission? Uh, I think this is important uh, to be exposed for us to move beyond the forms in which we are entrapped in relations, uh, in relation to the diverse ways that we act and think. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Um, and I suppose how we do that, frankly, is kind of embedded in everything we do. Like, so for example, I, as you've all heard me mention a few times now, I think that this dominant model of placement and the financial incentives built into that are a real problem. And so the way I identify and expose it is by constantly talking about that in settings like this and at conferences and so on. And crucially, not just being someone who, who is here to criticize, but who's here to create and to provide alternatives. And so um, our whole platform acts as a very real tangible, like go there right now if you want to, uh, tangible way to expose, I think, the, how contrived and sort of distorted the, the placement industry is and to present an alternative. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other part of it is the EDGE platform. And by offering not just some kind of occasional Zoom calls or, hey, you know, read this thing before you go, but a really rigorous, you know, oftentimes semester long or sometimes it's even two semesters long um, online learning ecosystem with curriculum, mentorship, storytelling, reflection, all of these opportunities um, to be asking these hard questions. And I think if, if um, you know, we have the talk about like, don't, don't do bad things, don't kind of um, be naive, good intentions are not enough. If that's like a conversation we have one time uh, as part of the like orientation workshop, but that's it, I think we're really failing our students. So we've tried to create a space where that can be an ongoing process of learning and reflection. And if I can add um, to that, um, part of uh, like what Campus Compact is looking at and asking institutions to think about is, what is your reputation of harm with the community? And being able to really reflect on that, both in questions with like, in partnership with the community, asking and understanding that reputation of harm, and even bringing that to students to understand. And then thinking about the ways that once you expose that, how that also exposes the aspects of power dynamics um, and ways then which what we need to tackle in order to continue to address those. Um, we are at time and want to be able to 